I was going to divide film directing into seven distinct possible styles. Categories called classical, realistic, madcap, expressionistic, operatic, painterly and encyclopedic. But then I realized, when you think about it, there are actually only two possibilities. Either the director makes himself invisible, or the director makes himself... No, it's not what you're thinking. Or the director makes himself visible. No idea why you were thinking of something else. Invisible director is what is usually called the classical style. I also call it sober to differentiate it from classical cinema, which was an era as much as a style. But let's not get too technical, he says right before getting too technical. <laughs> Have you ever had tea at the Ritz? You will identify this sober style by not noticing it. It's when the director lets the story speak for itself. From silent cinema until the late 60s, the classical style was influenced by theater. Directors would arrange actors in easily understandable positions, and the camera would shoot them clearly in ways that would never confuse the audience or even remind them that a camera existed. From the 70s forward, though, some flourishes that came from visible directing became more and more common, like fast cuts and a more constant use of close-ups. Nowadays, most films in the sober style have nothing to do with the classical era. They're faster, have too many angles, use music far more often and don't shy away from handheld camera work. What persists, however, is that most directors are not invasive and tell their stories clearly. Now let's talk about the opposite style. <laughs> the stylized style. I call it visible directing, stylized directing, eccentric directing, but my favorite name for it will always be Elamidem. What is Elamidem? It's an acronym I made up that stands for Everybody look at me, I'm directing a movie. It's when the director grabs you by the throat, forces your eyes open and has you look at all his directing. Look the story doesn't speak for itself. It is being led by a showy guide. Everything that is flashy applies to Elamidem. Expressionistic angles? Elamidem. Distorted or weird images? Elamidem. Slow motion? Elamidem. Over the top camera movements? Everything that is over the top is Elamidem. Just check HBO's Euphoria. That is one Elamidem marathon. The directors desperately want you to notice how much directing they can fit into one hour of television in every conceivable way. Directing in such a stylized way can be helpful to give the audience the appropriate energy and feeling. Martin Scorsese is the master of doing this. His encyclopedic crime stories, Goodfellas, Casino, Gangs of New York, The Wolf of Wall Street and I Heard You Paint Houses use tracking shots, fast cuts, slow motion, acceleration, freeze frames and musical montages to drag you to a narrative whirlwind, so you can better receive the enormous amount of information his narrators throw your way. With that said, the Lamida might sound like a recent phenomenon. But here is the truth about cinema. No matter what you can come up with, no matter what original idea for a story or a style or your imagination might conceive, everything, and I'm not exaggerating here, everything was already done in the 1920s. There were already fast cuts, slow motion, tracking shots, dramatic angles, insane compositions, you name it. The only exception was computer-generated images, for obvious reasons. Elamidem, therefore, has been with cinema for over a hundred years, and many great directors knew how to use it. Alfred Hitchcock was famous for his ostentatious camera movements meant to highlight suspense. Orson Welles had an eye for distorted, shadowy angles, and Kubrick loved him some symmetry. It all goes to show that the sober and the eccentric are not mutually exclusive, because film directing is a spectrum. Many films are 100% sober, but practically no film is completely eccentric. Being over the top can be considered that then a tool that helps put the audience in the required emotional and psychological state this story requires. T'as malin toi, hein? Chaque fois, je suis obligé de récupérer le gravier dans le gazon. Moi, quand je vois du gravier, c'est pas qu'un principe, c'est une question de style. Pour la petite demoiselle. So you see, the Lemidem approach can often be the absolute best strategy. With that said, let me now bash it. Over-directing is way too frequently the stuff of young directors trying to show off. They don't know discretion, so they'll shoehorn as many flourishes as they can to pass off as good filmmakers. When you can see through it though, you don't buy it. 
The problem is so many movie buffs can't see through it and all too often we find lists of best directors that downgrade the great names of classical cinema, like Howard Hawks, William Wyler, John Huston and Ernst Lubitsch. I'm very sorry, Count Album, it is most embarrassing, but the lady who brought with you tonight is spreading communistic propaganda in the powder room. What? Give me another double brandy. In favor of recent filmmakers with glitzy styles, like Wes Anderson, Quentin Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, David Fincher and Zack Snyder. The reason for this is not lack of taste. Actually, these are mostly good directors. The reason is, when you are learning about cinema, the only way to recognize a director's style is when he goes elamidam. Film books and lessons seldom teach you to notice blocking, timing and other discrete traits. They teach you about tracking shots, montages and what else sticks out. So when coming-of-age cinephiles need to pick their favorite filmmakers, they choose those that actually help them answer the question. So why? Is he your favorite director? It's no wonder many flashy directors get more and more sober as they grow older. They're directing at least. Paul Thomas Anderson, David Fincher and Guy Ritchie abandoned the excesses of their earlier careers. Even Edgar Wright seems to have himself under control now. On the other hand, Wes Anderson somehow doubled down on his idiosyncrasies and his live-action films have never been better. Let me now show you the difference between good Elamidem and bad Elamidem. This is Alfred Hitchcock Hitchcock using camera movement to create suspense in Young and Innocent. The characters are looking for a killer and all they know about him is he has an eye twitch. So Hitchcock moves the camera around to show us anyone can be the killer. Before ending this wide shot as a super close up of the killer we're looking for. Yes, it's showy, but it calls for your attention and pays you for it. You know that something important is coming, so you glue your eyes to the screen. Now here is David Fincher using camera movement to create suspense in Panic Room. While Jodie Foster sleeps, thieves are trying to break in. You're flexing your visual effects, but so far so good. Do we need to enter the keyhole? I mean, it looks cool and all, but no, the camera won't go through that coffee maker handle, will it? Why? So unnecessary. Look at me when you're talking to me! Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and share it. And who is your favorite showy director? Leave a comment. I will see you next time and this is MovieWise.